Well, Ellie, very well run session. Thank you. That was enjoyable. I, I think everyone should be back with us. Um, David, if you want to take it away. Yes, is, uh, is our special guest on? Yes, he was in our room. <laughs> oh, was he? <laughs> I am. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed the conversation. I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having having me on the net here, as we say, uh, with the group. <laughs> well, it's such a privilege. And I, I think um, one of the things I just wanted to point out real quick is we, we know we only got 30 minutes with you, which is uh, a real privilege. So thanks. So I'll sort of move quickly. But what I'm going to do is I'll just go over your, your bio, make a little bit of an introduction. I'll take you through a couple of questions that, uh, that I think are relevant. And then um, we'll open it to the floor. We'll get you out of here at 10 sharp, though. OK, thank you. Uh, and uh, but I think, you know, very quickly, it's um, uh, I've had the, the pleasure, obviously, to get you to know, know you and your family a bit here. And uh, I can imagine standing on the plane at West Point in 1988 and now being a commanding general of the First Harbor Division. Uh, that's uh, you've done a few things in your career. And I'm happy to point out that uh, not only that, um, but um, clearly, uh, keeping our enemies worried is your primary job, and you guys do an exemplary, exemplar job of that. And I think it's a, we're quite privileged to have uh, Fort Bliss and, and soldiers uh, uh, like you folks that take care of our freedoms and keep us safe from all these things that are going on out in the world. And I know that uh, it's something that I think that uh, uh, all of El Paso cares a great deal about is how do we support you folks and how do we help you? So that's one thing. But I also just wanted to make it also clear that not only are you um, a warrior who keeps our enemies worried, but you're also uh, a, a very thoughtful sort of great man in your own right. You have a lovely family. Uh, a fabulous wife who does a lot to support the community here. Uh, three lovely kids. Um, you're a philosophy major, which I love. We've talked about that in the past. And, um, and also, I would say that uh, not only that, you're very committed to this community as well. So much so that you're just back from Afghanistan. And uh, you're here. Uh, as you're getting ready to transition to Korea. And I think that says an awful lot. We appreciate you carving out that time and uh, especially for the chamber in our class here, 42. So um, I just wanted to say thank you and make that introduction. So thank you. Well, so thank, thank, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Can the, group hear, can the group hear me well enough? I think on the thumbs up, okay. And some head shaking, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but I would no. also ask if anybody can mute their microphone who is a Don, I'd appreciate that. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, but uh, anyway, listen, sir, if you don't mind, I'll ask a couple of questions. I think some of them are fairly straightforward, um, but I think it's a, this is a leadership class. And one of the things that I've always admired about the Army is the fact that um, um, I think how superbly leadership is groomed and managed within the ranks. It's something that I know that the military takes very seriously um, and to great effect. And I was just wondering maybe if you could spend a minute uh, giving some perspective to this class, also interested in leadership by definition, as to how the Army and, or the military overall, whichever perspective you like to take, uh, how they think about leadership and why it's so important to them. I was working the mic. I, I'd be glad to. And should, shall I jump right into that? Please, sir. Okay. I, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I, pre, I do appreciate it. And I appreciate these opportunities. Uh, and I'm impressed. Uh, um, I don't know uh, all of the details of the program, but I'm impressed that there's a formal leader development effort uh, in the community. That's, that's, uh, it seems once you have one and it works and you see the benefit of it, it seems like why in the world would you not do it? But yet there are lots of organizations across <laughs> the world and our, our country that don't take the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it is time consuming, uh, but the return on the investment for leader development, uh, in my experience is always you know well worth it, right? It, it gives back and it keeps giving back. And it just makes everything else that you do uh, better. 
in the in the military, and some of you are probably familiar with the construct, in the Army, we, we talk about leader development in terms of uh, three domains, institutional, our formal training, uh, individual, the effort that we expect each person to do and the, to invest in themselves, reading, uh, participating in, uh, you know, events like this, um, and also in your actual position, your, your organizational domain. In other words, the practical experience that you get from, you know, being in charge, and that that uh, that construct has has stood uh, a long time, and, I, and there's, I've never heard anybody even talk about changing the construct because at the end of the day, it just sort of works, and it describes what we actually do, and it's, it's been around for a long, long time, all the way back post World War II. So this is something that we we commit to, and, I, and it's funny you mentioned a couple of things there. In uh, uh, we changed out one of our brigade commanders, so a colonel um, who's been in the army 22 years, uh, commands about 4,000 soldiers. And in my remarks on the parade field yesterday, in the 107 degree, <laughs> <laughs> it was I said we the first armor division we only really do two things: leader development and prepare for war. That's it. Those are the only two things we really do. Now we got lots of programs and names and things and, and acronyms as I know many of you are familiar with the military acronym soup. But at the end of the day, fundamentally, that's what we do. We train leaders and we prepare. That's it. And we're blessed. You know, we're blessed with a nation that supports us uh, with uh, resources that allow us to have time uh, to go to school, to to spend time and so we have a lot of advantages and one of the things is I've learned more over these years about civilian organizations is a lot of civilian organizations are fully committed with all of the resources that they have and it's quite difficult to actually take a step back and spend time on development um, but I would say I would offer that as just a critical aspect of, of, of investing in your people is to actually carve out time and resources um, to do it. So, you know, tomorrow is an example. Um, they might not like it, but I've got um, 30 battalion commanders who are going to come here on Saturday morning. We'll be in spinning clothes and I'm going to spend three hours tomorrow morning investing in them as leaders and, and just walking through the kinds of problems that they're going to experience and the challenges that they're going to have and try to give them some wisdom based on my experience and my perspective. Um, and so I think the first indication of a really healthy organization is that you actually stop and, and invest in each other. And it's a, te it's a team sport. It is uh, subordinates, superiors. That's a, that's a very formal construct in the military, but it's, you know, all those informal relationships are huge. And, and the second thing you mentioned on the plane at West Point, you know, it was like 1,400 days at West Point. And those are 1,400 long days. <laughs> <laughs> You don't remember all of them. <laughs> you learn something every single one of those days. And, and, and you're obviously a different person when you go to the academy. I was 18 years old and I left, you know, when I was 22. And, um, but I only, I actually only remember specifically just a very few things. And one of them was the day before we stood on the plane and the president, uh, the vice president Bush, uh, uh, 41, I guess we call them, uh, was um, was handing out the diplomas. Our commandant of cadets, uh, one-star general who who was responsible for leadership development at the academy, um, he he said something I I have remembered, um, and he said when the crisis. So you what he said was, and I'll I'll translate in the sort of crisis leadership. But what he said was. And when you pin on, you actually put the lieutenant's rank on them all, and you actually get a commission from the president of the United States, and the Senate says you can serve in the, in the U.S. Army. Turns out, like 15 minutes after that happens, you're going to be feeling really good. You're going to be the exact same person that you are right now. <laughs> there's, there's no magic. There's no, you know. So when you hit, when you hit the when the crisis hits you, or or there's a tough spot in your organization, it turns out that that there, no, there's nothing magical that happens. All of a sudden you don't become a better leader um, because there's this thing that happened or, or you got promoted and uh, you got, you know, for you, you know, and there's positional movement within your, 
within each of your organizations, you're going to be the exact, you get that promotion. It feels great. It feels wonderful. It turns out you're the exact same person that you were right before you got that promotion. You know the exact same things that you knew before. You have the same leadership skills. You have the same characters of behavior. And I think that's important to realize um, because you can't, you can't, there's, there's no magic pill that just happens because your organization is going through a tough period of, of time. So I, I really applaud uh, your efforts at leader development. And I, I give the same advice to all of the officers and non-commissioned officers. Take time every day to invest in somebody in your organization and, and give them a perspective, talk them through a problem, ask them what would they do, you know, what, what would they do? You have a decision in front of you. What would they do and why? And those investments uh, come back in, in just awesome ways as you, as you continue to uh, execute whatever missions or tasks uh, or functions uh, you have. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and, and back over to you, David. General, thank you. It's a, a perfect segue to actually what I was going to go to next, because I think that, um, I mean, obviously right now we're seeing COVID, um, it seems like we've never left the first wave. Um, if anything, it's getting a little bit worse. Um, and there's a lot of bad news in that, obviously. But I think at one level, it's also very good to remember that at some point this will be over. And, um, and, and one thing that I think that all business can learn from the military is this idea that you were already chatting about with us, but maybe we could um, um, dive into a bit more, is this idea of resilience and organizational resilience. You touched on a lot of techniques around that, not only on leadership development, but I think uh, one of the things I've always thought is very interesting that the military does, they know that planning often doesn't stand up in the face of <laughs> what you want to have happen, the enemy often doesn't. And so you wind up needing to come up with a plan B quite often. And, and I understand that you um, do a lot of scenario planning uh, to try to address that, um, that issue. And I don't think that would be something that would be a small thing for business to consider doing in this crisis as well. I was wondering if you could sort of share about that process, the methodology, how the military looks at resilience, just generally speaking. Get the mic back on. Um, I'd be more than glad to. So I, so I kind of telegraph some of the thoughts there that, um, that I think lead into um, how you handle crises and adversity. Um, and I think uh, so I, and I, I wrote out just a couple of notes and I'll, and I'll finish with the idea of, of planning. So first of all, I think to right along the lines of what I finished with last, the tool, the tools that you practice sort of the behaviors and the processes that you practice with in your normal day to day operations, or let's say a, a smaller, more manageable problem that falls something short of a crisis. Those, practicing those tools is what gets you the muscle memory and the mental memory and the intellectual space to then carry it forward under pressure, right? Um, and so we have, uh, you know, it's reps and sets and you, and you all, there's lots of sports analogies out there, but you, you hear all the time about, a, you know, the, the uh, rookie quarterback in the world's, you know, moving by, uh, you know, a million miles an hour. And as they become veterans, the world slows down. And I think leadership is like that, right? The more you practice it, the more decisions you you make, or in some cases don't make because you you need somebody else or allow somebody else to do it. I think it re life you know really does slow down, and you can think a little bit ahead. And so it's uh, it's something you're 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 gonna you know be able to to work on. And many of you, I'm sure, have excellent personal examples and experiences. The second thing I always emphasize with leaders is your your personal example under pressure is the decisive ingredient <laughs> of your organization's ability to handle the adversity, to maintain resiliency, and it just it's just a it's a human thing. It's it's your it's your facial expressions. Uh, it's your your willingness to look people in the eye and speak truthfully, candidly, but respectfully. It's it's not you know it's your temper. It's it's uh, you know most most 
organizations know when their leader is frustrated. You don't have to. You don't have to behave frustrated. They already figured it out. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> you can still you can still be a pleasant person, and everybody in your organization understands that you're not pleased or you know whatever it is that that happens to be the day. So I. So I think it's, I, I tell my officers that every time they get promoted, they need to double the amount of patience that they have every single time. Uh, because nobody in your organization is trying to screw up. Nobody's trying to do the wrong thing. Nobody wants to have the crisis. <laughs> and, and they really respect and trust when you uh, maintain your bearing. You keep your head, right? We talk about keeping your head all the time. So um, the third thing I wrote down was, it's good to think right up front what kind of problem you have. And, and here I make a distinction between, is, this, is, is, is the problem that I'm dealing with part of the environment? Is it unique to my organization? Is it part of, you know, COVID is a good example. We are all uh, working through the challenges of COVID and then each of our organizations has particular needs and requirements on how we respond to that. Or is this an internal organization problem? Is this something that we have a crisis in our own team? Uh, we, it could be somebody's behavior. It could be, uh, you know, misconduct. It could be, and I know everybody in this group's dealt with all of those things to one degree or the other, but I think it's really helpful for the leader to kind of ask that question right up front. What, what, what am I dealing with here? Because I think the way you come after the way you, what comes after that is going to be fundamentally different in terms of how the trust and the confidence of any organization um, would proceed. The, the fourth thing that I wrote down was this resource allocation. So there's nothing like a crisis or a stressful environment to really uh, demonstrate what's important to leaders. Because leaders in the face of pressure, leaders will reallocate resources. Their personal time being one of them, uh, maybe the most important one, but money and personnel resources and all the resources that you have. And, um, and you're going to, through your own behavior in a crisis, demonstrate what you think is important and who you trust <laughs> and who you might not trust as much. <laughs> And, and you can you can come out of uh, by your own behavior. You can make all the right decisions, but come out of a crisis less strong than you were when you went in. Um, and it's important. There's there's risk there that you have to accept as a leader. And there's some tough conversations sometimes that have to happen behind closed doors. To get after all of that, as David indicated, you know we do. A, you know, we don't get to practice live combat every day. We have to train in scenarios. That's what we do, and I know there's lots of folks with military backgrounds and, and other backgrounds. Uh, law enforcement, firefighting, medical, all of those institutions and all those professions and many others do scenario-based training. And it's a really powerful tool. When, one of our formal leadership courses for general officers is at the University of North Carolina. And we... Um, in that course, it's at their business school. And in that course, they actually ran two business simulations, two scenarios. And uh, one of the scenarios was about deciding what, what market allocation you were gonna uh, go between, a, a, it's a technology company between military technology and civilian technology. And the other one was about the work, uh, your, your human resource management based on the progression of your business model. And I'll tell you, the military officers, myself included, we didn't do very well at any of those scenarios because <laughs> that's those are skill sets that we had not practiced. Yeah, and that's not the kind of that's at that point in my career, those weren't the kind of decisions that I had been making. And I was really impressed with the quality of they were very simple scenarios, but they were very powerful scenarios about decision making uh, within those organizations. As it turned out, shortly after that course, um, I ended up in the Pentagon with a $27 billion portfolio, and I was making exactly those kinds of decisions <laughs> about where to, where to allocate resources. So I applaud, I applaud you, uh, you know, in thinking those ways 
And I think we use a technique uh, called a tabletop exercise. It's literally, we'll put a chart on a tabletop and we'll just <laughs> sketch out a scenario and we'll talk through the decisions associated with that. And I would encourage any organization to do that and do it before you have a problem um, because you'll be a better group of decision makers if you've practiced the process of decision making uh, before you really have to get really so Again, I'll pause oh, there. And I'll pause there. Well, thank you, sir. That was um, that was excellent. I'm going to just ask uh, people to mute their microphone, please, if we could, unless you're going to ask a question. And uh, we're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, but what I would say is, is at this point, I've probably asked enough questions. I'd like to turn it over to the group and see if anybody would like to um, ask uh, anything. Because we, we have a hard stop in 10 minutes, so I just want to make sure we give the class a chance to, to, to speak. Everybody's being quiet. All right, well then what I'll do is this. Um, maybe I can help them uh, uh, be brave enough to ask a question. I'll ask one more. Um, in the context of all of that, when we think about uh, how the military is is uh, approaching the current situation we're in and things like this, um, how do you feel, uh, how prepared are we? Um, in, in general terms, I don't want any, I, I realize I could easily cross over to something I shouldn't be asking. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, but I just feel is, do you feel that, uh, uh, that we are, you know, you're just back from Afghanistan, you have a chance to, to think about uh, Korea. How, how is the United States uh, military doing with all of this? Just in the broadest sense that I don't get anybody in trouble, obviously. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, thank you. So, I, you know, I, um, there's a lot to that question. So I'll, I'll say a couple pieces of it. The military uh, is in very good shape in terms of our readiness uh, to perform our missions. That's one side of it. The second side of it is the problems we uh, face are complicated and they're long term problems, right? And, uh, and David and I have talked about, you know, the, the, the skill of thinking long term. So in Korea, we've talked specifically about Korea, right? So Korea, you know, we think of Korea starting in 1950. It turns out it started much earlier than that. We had Marines in, in Korea um, in the late 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. And we've been involved with that country who is a wonderful partner and wonderful people, uh, you know, just uh, the Korean, the Koreans are just absolutely terrific people, hardworking and, and industrious and, and deserve the success that they have, they have achieved. So, so I think, you know, when you look at how the military is used, we have a, we, we talk about it in the army, we have a, um, we have a 12 o'clock high mentality, you know, the clock's going to click. We're gonna have a showdown in the middle of the street. We're gonna get on the train. We're gonna depart <laughs> the country, and uh, you know every problem gets solved uh, today. And it's that, and you all know from your your leadership experiences that's just not how it works. So we 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 commit to these very long term, very difficult challenges. Afghanistan is one of them. Have, have have there been real mistakes made in Afghanistan? Absolutely. Have there been real, real positive successes? Have the Afghans come a long way? Absolutely. You know, 20 years ago, this process started. And I would say as I left Afghanistan, um, for the first time in that 20 year period, the Afghans actually have a, a chance to be successful on their own. It may not work, they may not make it, but they actually have a chance. And that's hard to see when you're not in the country um, because it just looks like this big, long, frustrating problem that, <laughs> that we would like to go away. Uh, but I, you know, they, they, like every American citizen, the citizens of that country deserve peace and stability. And uh, if we can do something to help them do that, that's both good for them and, and good for us, then, then we're committed to doing that. So that's a short answer to a very complicated question, um, but military's in great shape. You know, the, the men and women in, in our 
Army and our armed services are just absolutely fantastic. Our job is to train them and make them safe and, and healthy. And when we ask them to go do tough things, we're gonna go do it as best as we can. And we're gonna bring as many of them back home as we possibly can. And I'll stop there with that. Well, then I think before we, um, I'm just looking at the clock, we are getting a little close. Um, would our chairs like to say anything before I sign us off? Just, uh, we just want to thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, I think this is a really good um, lesson for the class to hear and the insight that you have. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Such an honor to have you. Well, General, I think um, it's, been a, it's been an amazing uh, insight to resilience and leadership, exactly what the class uh, should be hearing. And I really do appreciate it. Um, I will say, I think on behalf of everybody, I always remain hugely impressed whenever I do anything over at Fort Bliss, for example, and I see the, uh, the men and women who are devoting themselves to standing on the wall for us. I, um, I, am, uh, I know that we'll never be able to really uh, fully understand what they go through to, to uh, protect the United States and our freedoms, but I, I want you to know how sincerely appreciative we all are. Um, I, I know to some extent, you know, thank you for your service could get worn out in the airport after a while, I'm sure, but it's sincerely meant and uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, everything you do, we wish you huge success. You've been a strong supporter of the chamber and this leadership class and everything else that we've been doing with you over the course of the last two years. And um, I, uh, I know I speak for everybody when I wish you and your uh, family and uh, 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 as much success as possible in Korea. So, um, and if anything we can do to support, please let us know. Uh, thank you very much. And, and to the two leads, thank you. Uh, good luck to each of you as you continue your personal development and uh, in your organizational development. And, and David, I th thank you for your friendship. Um, the, the officer replacing uh, me in command here in a couple of weeks is uh, his name is Scott Eflon. Um, he, uh, his first assignment in the Army was at Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, back in the late 1980s. And uh, he, he's a widower uh, now, but he met his wife, uh, his, his now passed away wife, who's just a wonderful person. Um, met her here. Uh, oh, they had really? a wonderful marriage for 30 years. So he comes back here uh, excited about living uh, on, uh, in El Paso, being you know, obviously the commanding general. So I think you're gonna, you know, it's been a privilege to be a part of this community for, for now four years because we were four years, before. yes, twice, and yeah. He's, and, yeah, and he's gonna come back and he'll feel the same way. So I hope you have the opportunity to interact with him. I wish you each the very best and the best of luck, and thank you again for for letting me spend the time with you.